And so by, uh, uh, COVID was introduced in the, you know, in the early, in the late 2019 time frame, uh, where where if you really go and you dig, you know, you can see elements of it talked about in December because the World Games were being played out in China in October and November of 2019. And then in 2020, or, uh, December of 2020, you started to hear little, little, you know, elements of, of some, uh, some uh, media reports that came out. And then all of a sudden, January, February, boom, we got hit, COVID, right? So then you had the, the, the COVID introduction and the whole purpose of COVID was to make sure that the 2020 election was in the bag, okay? And once they did that, the real part of COVID, the introduction of COVID, of this bio weapon by China, was to ensure that we could change our election system and process, okay? Mm. And a lot of examples about states that use mail-in ballots. Once, like Oregon, as an example, started using mail-in ballots in late 1990s, and they've never been anything but hardcore liberal progressives since then. So they knew that what the what the impact of mail-in ballots would be, and of course, uh, ballot harvesting, but principally mail-in ballots. So, so damn near everybody went, okay, can't have you know people going to the polls, and we're going to introduce mail-in ballots. And you know, so many people, to include Bill Barr, the Attorney General for for Trump, in June timeframe, June 2020, said mail-in ballots are filled with fraud. Everybody knew it. Everybody knows it. Filled with fraud. So 2020 comes along. Boom. 2020 is one of the most you know, dishonorable elections that we've ever had in the in the in the nation's history, because for anybody to think that there wasn't fraud involved and not one not one Republican governor has ever stood up and said maybe there was just a little bit of fraud in 2020 because they all can't stand Trump. None of them. I'm talking about every governor and every one of them has had anti Trump's, you know, statements or whatever. And I'm talking about Republicans, not never mind the Democrats. So, so how can you fix that? You know, Jimmy Carter was the, in charge of a commission, you know, that many years ago. And they ch put him and Scoop Jackson and various senators, you know, distinguished people that were retired. And they came up with a report. And the report's primary finding was you cannot have mail-in ballots because if it's a mail-in ballot. You know, I went to the voting booth the last time, whatever it was. And I walked in, in Palm Beach, and I walk in, and they know me. They say, Mr. President, could I see your identification? Yes, boom, here's this, here's that, everything. And then you sit, and you they watch you sign, and you really, there's not a lot you can do. I mean, if you wanted to be dishonest, it's sort of beautiful. Right. If instead of that, I'm going to send them a ballot. Right. It has to go through the postal services. It has to go through a lot of people. They mail you uh, houses that, you know, the house was demolished and the people have left. And it, it's so bad. The one thing with Jimmy Carter, he had a very strong commission. It was no mail-in ballots. And we're the only one that does elections this way anymore. They've gotten away from And them. this is a, it ticked up in a big way after COVID. It used to be like soldiers serving overseas. They used COVID to cheat. Yeah. Well, they used COVID to certainly push this mail-in ballot. Another thing well, no, that but they, that's, it's yes. a, but they use COVID to cheat. But here's a, so now we're here. Okay. So that was 2020. Now we're here in 2024, less than 90 days before the next major election. And and they had, the, and we just experienced an internal coup. So it, these are phases that I'm talking about. So the next phase is, and the, and, the, and it's not the final phase because we're getting ready to go into another one here. The next phase was, we got to have, we got to get rid of Biden. I mean, think about it. Joe Biden was put at Camp David for I think four or five days prior to that debate, to to rest and to prepare for that debate. There's no way in the world. In fact, what they did was they screwed Joe Biden. He came into that debate totally unprepared, not rested, and like he was, you know, he was well past his bedtime and got crushed in that debate. That gave them the immediate excuse to uh, to introduce, you know, the the next candidate, right, Kamala Harris. So out goes Joe. That's an internal coup. That's probably the third or fourth phase of this thing to make sure that they stay in power. And now you got Kamala Harris. Now, what we're seeing today from the left isn't just disagreement. It's pure venomous hatred. The left claims to stand for tolerance, acceptance, and diversity. But when you look at what they're actually saying, it's anything but that. The level of intolerance is hypocritical. 
These are the same people who insist they're the champions of inclusivity. It's hypocrisy at its finest. On the right, you don't see that same mindset. Sure, conservatives think the left is misguided, maybe even foolish, but there isn't this deep-seated hate toward them. It's more like, you're wrong, but let's talk about it. But the left, they've taken their disdain to a new level, pushing intolerance and silencing any views that don't align with their agenda. I believe that we actually do have a threat to democracy in this country, but unfortunately, it's not the threat to democracy that Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz want to talk about. It is the threat of censorship. It's Americans casting aside lifelong friendships because of disagreements over politics. It's big technology companies silencing their fellow citizens. And it's Kamala Harris saying that rather than debate and persuade her fellow Americans, she'd like to censor people who engage in misinformation. I think that is a much bigger threat to democracy than anything that we've seen in this country in the last four years, in the last 40. You can say goodbye to diversity of thought under Kamala, even though we should be able to debate ideas have honest conversations, and let the best argument win. That's what the marketplace of ideas is all about. But the left doesn't want that. They want control over the narrative. They want their way only, spoken like a true tyrant. Um, I mean, the, the reason for this petition in support of the Constitution is because the Constitution really is under attack. Um, one prominent Democrat after another has been saying that freedom of speech, the First Amendment, is, is a is, is a, a, a bad thing. John yeah, John Kerry literally said that. Tim Walls! Tim and, and Tim Walls. And yeah, and Hillary. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like a long list. It's, it's, they're, they're not like, you know, mid-level people. in the, It's like the top people in the Democrat Party are saying the First Amendment's uh, an obstacle, and, and then they, they, they will refer to it, uh, you know, like, they use the word disinformation. Like, it's a pretty uh, good uh, indication that if someone's using the word disinformation a lot, they are the ones creating the disinformation. So. And, 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 and you know who, the, 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 you know, if you're trying to figure out, well, like, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, the, 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 the people who are trying to suppress freedom of speech, they are the bad guys, you know? So, um, it, but it's, it's actually astonishing that, that we're even in this position in 2024 in America. It's hard to even believe that this is real, you know? Uh, and, and some of the crazy stuff that I see happening, like California passing a law, making it illegal uh, to, to require voter ID in any election in the state. Like, like not, not even like for like a city council. Um, and I, a friend of mine went to, to, to vote in, in Palo Alto in California because he was like, is this real or, or not? And he, he, he like tried to show his ID and, and, it, and it was like, a, like presenting a cross to a vampire. Like they're like, no, no, put the ID away. You know, like they literally, could, they weren't allowed to look at his ID even if he wanted to show it to them. That is the extent of the madness. This is a real thing in California right now. And if, if the Dems win nationally, they'll do it nationwide. Obviously, that's what's going to happen. And there will be no democracy. Um, and they, they, California just passed, which is shocking, it's hard to believe this is even, this is even real, but California just passed a law making it illegal uh, to require voter ID in any election at all in California. Did you, you didn't know that? No. Yeah, Newsom signed it into law last week. It's illegal to require an ID. In any election, even a town council. And, and a friend of mine who was, who thought, this, can the, who lives in Palo Alto was like, it, it was like, is this actually r real? And he went to like vote in like some city council election he tried to show them his ID, and they said, we're not even allowed to look at your ID. Have they this ex is extended the same? actually what's going on right now. But By the way, they're proud of it. They're not hiding it. But it's, it's only low. voting. It's not, it's not buying a gun or buying liquor or buying a pack of cigarettes or flying on an airplane or renting a hotel room. It's only voting that it's illegal. Oh, if you try to buy a gun, I mean, they're going to ID you six ways a Sunday. Uh, it's, 
Yeah, they try. California is trying to make it basically equal to its own again. That's that's why I think this is the most important election of our lifetime. Uh, President Trump is the only one who can save democracy. Elon Musk is right. Democrats aren't stupid. They know that if you flood swing states with immigrants and then make it easier for anyone to vote, citizen or not, they can secure a permanent voting base. That's not democracy, folks. That's rigging the system. Elon is right. If this goes unchecked, the U.S. is on a fast track to becoming a one-party country. And we've all seen what happens when one party has all the power. Just look at places like Venezuela. Once you've got a one-party system in place, they can change the rules to keep themselves in power forever and the will of the people becomes nothing more than a footnote in history. We've already seen the effects of weak borders and unchecked immigration. Crime rates are soaring in cities that have become sanctuary havens. Schools and hospitals are overwhelmed. But now we're talking about using this same immigration crisis to permanently alter the political landscape. That's a whole new level of corruption. And here's where I have to laugh at the absurdity. We're told that requiring an ID is somehow racist or discriminatory. How insulting is that? The left is essentially saying that minorities can't figure out how to get an ID. If I were part of that community, I'd be furious at the condescension. Every other advanced country requires voter ID. This isn't rocket science, it's common sense. Once a one-party system takes hold, accountability goes out the window. They won't have to answer to anyone. Policies will get more extreme, more reckless, and we'll all pay the price. Just look at California. It's already a disaster. And now they want to export that same chaos to the rest of the country. No thanks. Um, um, and, and the same people that demanded vaccine IDs, for, if you want to travel or do anything, are the same ones who say no voter ID is required. Is there any reason Obviously hypocritical. to pass a law like that except to abet voter fraud? Um, it's, it's, for, it's, it's, it's so that fraud can never, cannot be proven. So it, it, it enables large-scale fraud and no way to prove it, because how would you prove it? It's literally impossible. No, no ID. You, you're not even allowed to show your ID. It's insane. Well, it is insane. Insane. Um, so, yeah. Um, the, the purpose of no voter ID is obviously to conduct fraud in elections, obviously. There can be no other explanation. I mean, they come up with some nice sounding thing. Um, People don't have IDs. Could you live in this country without an ID? Yeah, th th I mean, th 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 their common rebuttal is like it's racist to require ID, and which is insane. I think it's actually race racist and patronizing to say that people can't figure out how to get ID, obviously. But like, how could like, you uh, who, live who, here uh, without an ID? I don't think you, it's even you possible. You can't. Yeah. You can't do anything. Yeah. You need ID for everything. Like the list of the things you need ID for is basically everything, um, except voting. So. So you see the rest of the it's country. It's total bullshit, obviously. Come, obviously. Yes. But that doesn't in any way minimize the aggression or self-righteousness they bring to this conversation. Yes. Like it's, you're a racist if you want that. Right. Where, where's that? In fact, obviously, someone is racist if they say that uh, people of a particular race cannot get ID. That's patronizing and racist. That's absurd. Yes. yes. Yeah. Are illegals registered to vote in this election and do they actually vote? Yes, they do. And guess what? This is not new. And there is proof. This has been happening at least since the Obama administration, if many, if much proof is to be believed. And I'm going to present it to you. You're going to decide if you believe it. Of course, this is happening in every state, but it is a major concern in swing states, as Elon Musk pointed out this weekend, that there are triple digits increases of illegals in swing states over the past four years. Now, these are the states where the electoral votes are the most hotly contested right now. So interesting, right, that they would have this upswing in voters who would be new, who may be more democratically leaning. Of course, it is illegal to vote as a non-citizens, but many states say that they have proof that thousands of registered voters are non-citizens, and many of them don't even know that they've done it. In fact, many of them are self-identified as non-citizens. The state sees that, and the federal government is saying, you're going to leave those people alone. You cannot go and purge them. So think about it. 
someone goes in, marks a document, says, yes, I'm not, I'm not a citizen. And then they get a voter registration and the state says, oh, we see this list. And the federal government says, we will not let, allow you to purge these people. You have to allow them to stay on their voting registration. Why? The federal government now is suing these states that try to clean up their voter registration. Why are they doing this? Now, the media is framing this as voter removal, or they're calling it voter purges. Well, this is not new. Many states, such as Florida, require state authorities to maintain accurate voter registration records. Federal law requires the federal government to respond to inquiries from any federal, state, or local government agencies that want to verify any outliers, something they can't, we don't know about this guy, this guy doesn't seem to be legal, let's ask the federal government. Well, in Florida, the state compiled a list of people that they could not verify as citizens, sent it to the federal government, and the government responded, sorry, can't help you. We have a software for that, it's called SAVE. Just go on, get back. And so the Florida attorney general last week filed a lawsuit against the federal government. They say that when they asked the federal government for help, they got this BS letter in response. Now, it says basically, we can't help you. We have save for that. You got to use that. Can't do anything else. Sorry. Now, the letter references a lot of footnotes for things that they want to prove, except the part that I have highlighted here. This part says the evidence is clear that the laws are working as intended. It is extremely uncommon for non-citizens to vote in federal elections. Well, do you notice there's no footnote there? No proof at all. It says that the evidence is clear. Just a statement. But there's no evidence. Right. So, again, I'm going to. In the immortal words of Thomas Sowell, say, where is that evidence? Or what he, that. what he says, his quote is, show me that evidence. Because everything in this document is footnoted except that part that says there's evidence. And I'm like, well, where is it? <laughs> I'll read it. Tell me where it is. Uh, so they don't have evidence. They just point to their save database. That's this program if you're interested. Only Florida says, look, we know you think this is a good program, but we had to sue you to even get access to it because the federal government didn't want states to use it. They got access in 2012, but they still can't use it because it requires that the state have biographical information and a unique immigration identifier. Well, if they had that, They would need the federal government to help them. They would know who these people are. So they're making the federal government fill in the gaps. And the federal government is doing what every bureaucracy says is just, well, check the database. Can't help you. Move along. So the state of Florida now says that they know they have people in their database that are not citizens and they cannot get help. Here they say, in the months of filing this complaint, Florida has identified a number of individuals who they have evidence of non-citizenship but could not run a search because they don't have these numbers. All of these people are currently registered to vote. The question is, why doesn't the federal government want to help? Why won't they help them purge these numbers? They have evidence and they say that these people have records of voting and the media is saying that this is voter purging Um, and florida is now making the argument that this is the federal government's duty and they're demanding that a court order them to do it plus pay the legal fees now in fact not only is the federal government refusing to help florida and getting sued for it the federal government is suing virginia for even trying to clean up their voter logs. The Justice Department filed this lawsuit against the state of Virginia, they say, to challenge the state's program for removing voters too close to the election. Now, Virginia started going through this and its registration, it's been, they've been doing this all along. It's not new, but they say, well, you're in this 90-day window where you can't remove voters anymore. Here's what Governor Glenn Youngkin said about this on CNN. The Justice Department is suing your state's election officials alleging that you're violating federal law because you are purging voters that were flagged as potential non-citizens. Now, the issue is not the program, is my understanding. The issue is that your com- the Commonwealth of Virginia was doing it within 90 days of an election. As you know, and I just want to bring the viewers up to speed here, that's the, the so-called quiet period before an election, 90 days where you're not supposed to be doing such purging. Uh, what, what is your response to, the, to this lawsuit? Yeah. So let me just begin with just correcting a few of the facts that you used to set this up. So first and foremost, this is a law that's been on our books since 2006. 
Yep. It was a law that was signed by then Democrat Governor Tim Kaine, and it requires our election process and governors to use DMV data when an individual self-identifies as a non-citizen and there is a match with that person on the voter rolls to then notify that person that they have 14 days to affirm that they're a citizen or not. And if they're not, then they are removed. This process has been in, in place since 2006. We yep. just had recent Democrat governors like Terry McAuliffe and Ralph Northam use this exact same process within the 90 day period because it is individualized. An individual starts the process by self-identifying as a non-citizen. And therefore, as governor, I have an obligation, no discretion, to then run the process to notify that person through our registrar that they have 14 days to, to clear it up. And if they don't clear it up, they're going to be removed from the voter rolls. The big question I have is, given the clarity of the constitutionality of what I just described, both at the federal level and the state level, and laws yeah. at the federal level and the state level that not only require me to do this, but are focused on the fact that these are individual steps that start with someone identifying as a non-citizen, why is it that anyone could argue that, that a process that removes non-citizens off of our voter rolls is anything else other than common sense and constitutional? And that's, so, my, that's, my, that's my frustration with this whole process, yeah. which is it started so, 25 days before a presidential election. They could have started it a long time ago. We would have sorted this out because I firmly believe they are wrong. But this seems far more political than otherwise, simply because of the fact this has been going on since 2006, according to law. And they chose 25 days before an election in Virginia in order to assert something which really is inconsistent with the process that we're doing. So. I mean, consider that the governor has a list of people who have self-identified as illegals and the Justice Department says, you got to leave that. You got to leave that alone. You can't do anything about it. And we're going to sue you now, even though they've had the protocol of this law since Tim Kaine was governor. So how is this happening? Is this, I dare say, weaponization of the Justice Department in order to interfere with an election? Maybe uh, he goes on to say that there are 6,300 people who fit this bill in his state and they can contest this if they are, in fact, legal voters. And this was a mistake. They can either contest it or they can show up with proper I.D. and vote on the day of the election because their laws allow it. So what are Democrats so worried about? Fill in the blanks, right? Obviously. In Texas, the media is also accusing the state of purging voters. But if you look at the governor's own account of who was removed, the numbers are quite similar. 6,500 non-citizens, 6,000 with a felony conviction. Well, what do, what do Democrats want to do? Just leave them there? That's not what the laws are. Um, over four. 4,507, sorry, 457,000 deceased people. Shouldn't we just be able to get dead people off the list? That, sh that seems like that would be okay. Um, you know, voters who requested to be taken off. Now, the governor also says that of these 6,500 potential non-citizens, 1,930 have records of voting, meaning almost 2,000 of them have voted as illegals before. So when the federal government says it's extremely rare, I don't think 2,000 people who are illegally voting as non-citizens in Texas is extremely rare. I mean, I guess statistically it is, but it's happening enough that the government should be able to say, we're going to take those people out. We're going to do something about it. What the federal government is saying, you can't. You can't do that. Now, in Alabama, the Secretary of State pledged to clean up voter logs, but a, fe uh, logs, but a federal court issued this injunction last week saying they can't do that now. Look who the plaintiff is. The Justice Department, again, suing a state because they don't want the state to scrutinize voter records. In Georgia, a judge ruled that seven new election rules passed by the Republican State Election Board were illegal and unconstitutional. So now they say they cannot even hand count ballots. Not allowed. 
even though that's what the Secretary of State wanted. So what Democrats say they worry about is legitimate people being pulled from voting when they should be allowed to vote, or at least they say that's what they're worried about. And again, many of those people are given the chance to respond, and the state can also allow them to show up with a proper ID. Democrats you know, really act like that's just too onerous, and these people are too disenfranchised. I mean, what do they think of these people, the, the inability to get an ID that they just couldn't do it, right? Now, if Democrats really cared so much, though, about this disenfranchised population, they would be listening to this whistleblower, Jay Christian Adams. He was a former attorney from the United States Department of Justice under both Presidents Bush and Obama. In May of this year, he testified to Congress that illegals are being dragged into being registered by the DMV. Often, they don't know it because they don't understand. They're not screened in the language that they speak. And they're just registered without their knowledge. It's not necessarily nefarious in in most instances. But this is a problem because Mm -hmm. when that happens, that increases their risk of deportation. Do we care about that? No. Now, listen to what he has to say because it's fascinating. It's a bit long, but it's worth it. It's about four minutes. And I want us to hear this because this proves Democrats don't give a shit about these people and actually endangering them. They just want them on their logs. It's a numbers game. Listen. In this polarized atmosphere, it would be wonderful if we could agree on a few basic facts. Non-citizens are, in fact, getting onto American voter rolls, and some of them are voting. The data show that most often non-citizens are getting on the rolls through the motor voter process or third-party registration drives. Ignoring this problem ignores the harmful impacts to both our elections, but also to the aliens who are caught in the system breakdown. Because they have registered to vote, often at the behest of third parties or bureaucrats, these well-meaning green card holders face deportation. When a foreigner registers to vote in the motor voter system, as undeniably happened by the thousands in Pennsylvania, every American should be concerned. Once upon a time, fixing this problem would have been a bipartisan priority. We've identified four core elements that lead to foreigners registering and voting. Number one, a faulty motor voter system facilitates alien registration and then voting. We discovered this most dramatically in Pennsylvania in 2017, where every PennDOT customer was offered voter registration for an estimated two decades regardless of citizenship. Even worse, foreign language customers were screened in different written languages than the ones they speak that increased the number of foreign voter registrations. Element two, when states do not or are prevented from investigating prior claims of non-citizenship, foreign nationals fill the roles. In previous years, states like Florida and Texas have been disrupted by the courts from trying to study indications of foreign citizenship among existing registrants. Element three, when election officials do not carefully review forms, foreigners get registered. The federal form that Congress approved 30 years ago requires an attestation of US citizenship via a checkbox. After 30 years of motor voter, we can conclusively say the checkbox honor system has failed. Unfortunately, my organization is found in California, Florida, Texas, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and other states where applicants actually admitted on the registration form they weren't U.S. citizens and still got registered to vote. We call these checkbox no's. Litigation that the Public Interest Legal Foundation has brought has revealed disturbing numbers of checkbox no's. Registrations across the country where they tell the election official they're not a citizen and they still get registered to vote. Election officials are dropping the ball. Finally, element four, a lack of transparency. Secrecy preserves bad practices and fosters conspiratorial concerns. When people don't know the truth, they think things up that aren't true. And that's why states have to comply with Section 8 of NVRA and disclose public records. In 2024, it is no longer an open question whether foreign foreign nationals are registering and voting. Anyone who would try to argue otherwise has not read the data. We have documented the problems. We've documented the Middle Eastern immigrant whose green card was revoked in Pennsylvania after PennDOT offered him registration in an unfamiliar language. 
He lost seven years of his life trying to clear his name until Pennsylvania admitted to a mass glitch in the motor voter system. We've documented the Sudanese refugee in Pittsburgh who was given an English voter registration form at a time when he needed an interpreter. We found records of a San Francisco college student whose coursework was disrupted because he mistook a federal voter drive for a campus election. This is just a tiny sample of the stacks of documents that we have available of victims, aliens who are in the green card process, who've been sucked into the motor voter system, registered to vote, and jeopardize their legal status in the United States. People are registering through a broken motor voter system. They're victims to this broken system, and Congress can fix it through a few basic, simple fixes. Thank you very much. A stack, a stack. Now of they documents. don't stack. want to. Of course they, they don't, don't want to. want to fix this. Of course they don't, and they'll right. fight it tooth and nail, like we're seeing from the Department of Justice fighting this tooth and nail. Why would you have Merrick Garland fighting against fixing this? Right. Well, he, in his book, I want to show you the the cover to his book because he talks about how this goes back to Eric Holder, how they actually had corruption, people going to register illegals to vote with the ballot filled out already and just had them sign things that they didn't know. He was a Justice Department whistleblower and he saw it happening under Eric Holder. And so I'm currently reading this book. He's saying this is happening. The federal government is preventing these states from trying to fix it. Why? The DMV is complicit with, oh, here comes an illegal immigrant or someone who's a green card holder. Just stinking wants a driver's license. That's it. Does not mean to register to vote. And they're pulled in and all of a sudden, oh, their vote's Democratic. That's interesting, right? So when you see the news media saying this doesn't happen, this is voter purging, it's conspiracy, it's not. So there you go. There's some proof for you. Let me know what you think about that. <sighs> It's maddening. I see so many people in the chat. They're like, and they won't fix it. I mean, yeah. and yeah, it's happening right at the DMV, right? Exactly. Uh, terrifying. All right. I mean, why would you do that to someone, though? Because you've just made them guilty of a federal crime that they don't understand. You're like, let me fill this out right? for you. I'm going to fill this out for you. You just got to sign it. So don't yeah. pretend, Democrats, that you care about immigrants. You don't, or else you would stop this. I'm not having that. Who would want people to come into our country from places unknown, like sometimes they'll say about a fighter, from parts unknown, right? right? Remember Haystack Scalhoun, from parts, <laughs> he says, yeah, from the parts days. unknown, the oldest, those are the yeah. oldest, that's even before you. But uh, who would want people to come in, pouring into our country, we don't know anything about it. But that's, I want to ask you this, why do you think they're doing that? I think because... Do you they, think they're trying to buy votes? I, do you think they I, just I want think, cheap labor? Like, what is, what's the okay, idea? Okay, there's a couple of theories. They hate our country, they're stupid, or they want to buy votes. It's one of those three things. Yeah. They want it. Now, they are trying to get people registered who, you know, don't even know what the country is. And they're is. trying to give people amnesty, people that live they here. They're trying to give them amnesty. They want to give them citizenship. And they want to... Well, and how about what if you happened think in, about the amount of money that they've given them when they've come here, the yeah. food stamps, the benefits that even our poor people aren't getting? $200 billion, and, and that's a way low number. That's a way low. You know, it's, it's interesting. New York has always been like, uh, you know, sort of like always looking for money. They've spent $100 billion on this stuff. I, I don't know where they – and they're not getting the money from the federal government. It's crazy. And because the mayor came out and said – we can't live like this. They investigated him. He gets in. I, by the way, I called it. I said he just got himself indicted. Mm. This group is stupid, but they're vicious. They're stupid people, but they're vicious people. It is much higher because of them. They allowed criminals, many, many millions of criminals. They allowed terrorists. They allowed common street criminals. They allowed people to come in, drug dealers, to come into our country. And they're now in the United States and told by their countries like Venezuela, don't ever come back or we're going to kill you. Do you know that crime in Venezuela and crime in countries all over the world is way down? You know why? Because they've taken their criminals off the street and they've given them to her to put into our country. And this will be one of the greatest mistakes in history for them to allow. And I think they probably did it because they think they're going to get votes, but it's not worth it because they're, they're destroying the fabric 
of our country by what they've done. There's never been anything done like this at all. They've destroyed the fabric of our country. Millions of people let in. And all over the world, crime is down. All over the world except here. Crime here is up and through the roof. Despite their fraudulent statements that they made, crime in this country is through the roof. And we have a new form of crime. It's called migrant crime. And it's happening at levels that nobody thought possible. It's undeniable that the Kamala Harris camp is using illegal immigrants to create fake votes to help her win. She imports trash onto the streets of the USA so that they can give her voter support. This is proved by the fact that a voter ID is no longer needed, as Elon Musk exposed. Because without a voter ID, anyone can vote. All Kamala needs to do is get as many illegals into the U.S. as possible to bump up her voter numbers. Elon's comments align with Trump's comments because with the banning of the voter's ID and with the mass importing of illegals in those very same states, it's as clear as day to see that Kamala is desperately trying to fake votes. This just shows you that she knows she's not for the people because if she was, she would have confidence in herself, yet she has to find legal loophole cheats in order to stand a chance against someone who's truly for the people. So you see the other 49 states becoming California if the machine wins? Well, you don't need uh, all, all 49 to, to go that way. You just need you know, enough to have the election, have, have there not be swing states. I mean, there are only six swing, swing states. Yep. So there are only six states out of 50 right now that are in contention. So if those six states that are in contention uh, by narrow margins are no longer in contention, then uh, the, the only contest will be for who wins the Democratic primary. That's how it is in California. That's how it is in New York. There's, there, there's, no, there's no party, uh, party versus party situation. The only contest is who wins the Democratic primary. And as we've seen with the um, uh, appointment of Kamala, who no one voted for, even in the Democratic primary. Yes. <laughs> Where's the democracy here? Well, it's, just, it's easier, though. I mean, it's, it's just that the Dem party the elite just decides yes. who, who, who is in charge. That's, an, that, 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 that's, that's a, a, you know, a, a tiny oligarchy, basically. Comprised of... That's not democracy. The richest people in the country. That's kind of the interesting part to me is that the richest people in the country are on board with this. I mean, that's what it is. It's, the, it's, it's a collection of billionaires, Well, right? most of them are, yeah. But you're not. Not me. And not everyone is. I think there's, but, but it, it, it is a shocking number of so-called billionaires are uh, in the Dem camp, more than are in the Republican camp. Oh, for sure. Which is wild. So the, in, in fact, the, the astonishing thing in the swing states is that, that, it's, that they're even a contest, given that uh, that the Dems have far more money than the Republicans. So, so the Kamala camp dramatically outspends the Trump campaign in the swing states. Um, the uh, overwhelming, the, the media is overwhelmingly pro-Democrat. So you've got, you know, the, the press, you know, is, is a, a Dem cheering squad. Um, and, um, you know, so, uh, oh, and then, and then you've got also all, all the, almost all the Hollywood and entertainment, the celebrities, uh, also, you know, in, endorsing Kamala and, and, and being pro Dem. Why do so, you so you got the, so you got the celebrities, you got the, they, they got the money, uh, they got, um, you got it. The, 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 basically, everything on the side of the Dems. The, the, the problem is the underdog, here, Trump's the underdog in swing, swing states, and still it's a contentious. It's, it's still a 50-50. After all that, what does that tell you? It tells me that if, if, if people actually knew what was going on, they weren't being fed nonstop propaganda, it would be a landslide in favor of Republicans. Yeah. Imagine having all of Hollywood, the media, news agencies, and the current president against you. And even with such odds against Trump, he's still very much in the run to win this election. It just shows you how much of a handicap Kamala needs to win, because it's clear as day that she isn't suited to be a president, because if she wins, it would have been a blatant robbery. The USA has lost its status as a true democracy because at the end of the day, there is a very large bias circulating in the political scene. And a democracy is not a democracy when it is influenced by biased agencies pushing one party significantly more than the other. So I'll ask you this question. 
why are the New York Times, Axios Media, uh, the D Detroit Free Press, I'm running uh, USA Today, uh, and the state of Pennsylvania now all telling us that we will not have a presidential winner on election night? I'll answer this one for you. They are conditioning us to get ready for a post-election turmoil in the United States, dare I say a civil war. Just so you understand, the media did this to us in 2020. They laid the groundwork for this election for the 2020 election as well, telling us not to expect a winner on that evening. I mean, it was stunning. Hold strong. Hold strong. Don't worry about it. Your boy Biden will eventually come out on top. This was the New York Times in 2020. How the media could get the election story wrong. We may not know the results for days, maybe weeks, the New York Times warned us. So it's time to rethink election night. This was back in 2020. Here is The Guardian in 2020 warning us then, will the U.S. media call the right winner on election night? Don't count on it. We can't rely on the media to call the election fairly. Here's what we need to know about it. And in fact, we all went to bed that night. America, United States of America went to bed that night. The polls closed. Right, this is bedtime. Polls closed. Americans going to bed. See that there? Closed. Polls are closed. Polls are closed. Reporting in 59% of precincts, 64% of precincts, 83% of precincts, 94% of precincts reporting. Polls closed across America. Look at those numbers. 54% Michigan, Pennsylvania, 57 to 41%. Georgia, 53 to 46%, 54 to 44%, 51. I mean, those numbers are pretty staggering. So America goes to bed and surprise, 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 surprise. Like my favorite Instagram <laughs> meme. Yes. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the it clock, was, wasn't it? It was. The clock struck midnight. Uh, Donald Trump was leading in all of those battleground states Pennsylvania, Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, and then. Well, something happened. What happened? Well, as LifeSite News explained in a great analysis piece, overnight on election night, the numbers flipped. Of course, Joe Biden, a candidate who struggled to attract even, I mean, uh, modest crowds at that point to his rallies, somehow garnered the most votes in American history. Look at how the liberal USA Today even showed Biden rallies. Notice the date on this right before Election Day. Look at that. Scenes from Joe Biden's 2020 campaign rallies. That's the that's the like the the photo they choose they chose to lead it off. Okay. Here's another Biden rally. Look at this. Look at all these excited people at a Biden rally. One guy so excited he's just he's a he's a reporter sitting there on a computer. There's like f there's like five people who are not related to Biden. Look at the Secret Service agents and then Jill Biden and then like four people. That guy's probably a reporter. <laughs> and then another guy with a laptop is another reporter. Anyway. Uh, and then it's amazing. And it, it really is amazing. On election night, Joe Biden received 81 million votes, a staggering 15 million more votes than Hillary Clinton did just four years earlier, more than President Obama. Again, more votes than any American president in history. Um, he is a hero. I mean, he's my hero. Mm. 81 million votes. How do you pull that off? It is amazing. Um, you can see the excitement in these voters' faces right behind all these COVID masks. You can see their excitement. Listen to what the New York Times just published this week on what to expect on election night. This is New York Times this week. Harris or Trump, once again, election, could, election results could take a while. More Americans are using mail-in ballots, which takes longer to count than those cast in person. In several battleground states, a winner may not be apparent on November 5th, of course. Quote, there will be no clear and immediate winner on election night, says the New York Times, and that early returns could give a false impression of who will ultimately prevail. You know where this sounds so familiar I'm thinking Germany, Pakistan. <laughs> in recent history, oh. this has been happening where the people's candidate, they go to bed and that candidate is winning and then overnight something happens. It's just, this sequel sucks. This I've heard this one before. I've read this one before. This is this is being well played. Yeah, you've seen play. this movie before. Someone in the chat on a Rumble says that the Civil War movie. I didn't see it, so I'm not going to watch that movie. I'm not giving any money to the Obama production company for watching that movie. But someone said that movie, Civil War movie, was just a lame movie about Trump derangement syndrome. Mm. Mm. Uh, so there will be no clear and immediate winner. The New York Times says. Well, they're not the only ones. Time Magazine. 
why we might not know the winner on election night. So Time Magazine also getting in on the liberal action here. Remember, you have to remember the New York Times, Time Magazine, uh, CBS News. They're, they're frankly uh, mouthpieces of the deep state, the CIA, as we've had um, we've had an FBI whistleblower here on the show explain to us that if they ever want to leak information, fake stories, plant stories into the media, they first go to the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time Magazine also on that list. They just funnel these stories to these uh, to these liberal magazines and liberal newspapers and get this message out there. That's what they do. So these are just accept- this is all part of an agenda. Time Magazine, why we might not know the winner on election night. Axios, 2020 deja vu all over again. Why the 2024 election it could take days to call, Axios says. Here's what Axios says more deeply. It's a near guarantee that Donald Trump will declare victory the night of November 5th, and the margin won't matter, Axios says. It won't matter whether he's accurate and he's actually won or whether he was defeated soundly. Quote, I think we should absolutely expect the super spreaders of disinformation will parrot the lies about the election in the immediate aftermath. That's what Axios says. And not to be outdone, the state of Pennsylvania, a battleground state, my home state, The Keystone State, Pennsylvania, 19 electoral votes. I would argue it's more important than any other swing state, not just because it's my home state, but this this election cycle, Pennsylvania, will determine who wins this presidential race this year. Not Florida, not Ohio, but all eyes on Pennsylvania because of those 19 electoral votes. If President Trump carries that, then those other states and their fewer electoral votes really don't matter from a swing state perspective. All eyes on Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania publishing this, letting us know Pennsylvania won't always know the final results of all races on election night. Any changes in results that occur as counties continue to count ballots are not evidence that an election is rigged. So Pennsylvania wants to get out in front in this and let you know that Pennsylvania might be too close to call, probably not on election night. You won't know who won Pennsylvania. I feel like they should have put the word not necessarily evidence. If they're saying we know already that the election is not rigged and the election has not happened, that's a preordained conclusion that makes me a little nervous. So they're saying we already know, full stop, election's not rigged. Well, it hasn't happened yet. Right. So right. let's just let's leave open a possibility of a corruption, given we have a lot of corruption. Uh, what brains in our rumble chat says source? Trust us. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. We all, so they know into the future the election's not rigged. I don't think anybody can say that with full certainty. Nobody can see the future. Pennsylvania can. OK. They're warning us all. And you should listen to your liberal media. You should listen to our liberal media. You should listen to all of the liberal media sources like the Detroit Detroit Free Press up there in Michigan, also getting in on the bandwagon uh, today. Delay in reporting election results in Detroit, Wayne, and Macomb counties raises concerns. So they are warning us in Michigan that we're going to see delays. So I I guess if the deep state keeps trying to kill Trump and can't succeed, they'll have to figure out another way. And that's why we're getting they're getting us ready for this election turmoil. Meanwhile, Tucker Carlson just wrote this this morning and asks, why are the deep state liberals trying to kill Trump? Here's what Tucker writes. Any political candidates might can be measured by their opponents fear of losing to to them. First of all, that's a beautiful sentence. Just look at that sentence for a second. Any political candidates might can be measured by their opponents fear of losing to them. If the other side thinks you're going to win, then your campaign is going pretty well. Based on the past two and a half months, it's clear that Donald Trump's opponents know he's going to win. Why else would they have tried to kill him twice? America hasn't seen anything like this in decades, and even though political violence has become uh, bizarrely common, it's worth taking a step back to acknowledge just how sick the people perpetrating it are. There's nothing less democratic than killing off the race's front runner, but they keep trying to do it anyway. And they keep calling Trump a threat to democracy. Peter Ducey asked Corinne Jean-Pierre that very question at the press at the White House press briefing. Basically, why are you guys trying to get Trump killed by calling him a threat? Because there are crazy people out there that are listening to you right now. Here was her response. Two days since somebody allegedly tried to kill Donald Trump again. And you're here at the podium in the White House briefing room calling him a threat. President Biden has been clear-eyed about the threat 
uh, that the former president represents to our democracy. How many more assassination attempts on Donald Trump until the president and the vice president and you pick a different word to describe Trump other than threat? Peter, if anything from this administration, uh, I actually uh, completely disagree with the premise of your question, the question that you're asking. Uh, it is also incredibly dangerous in the way that you're asking it uh, because American people are watching. And to say that, to say that from an administration who has consistently condemned political violence, from an administration where the president called the former president and was thankful, grateful that he was okay, from an administration who has called out January 6, called out the attack of Paul Pelosi, called out and said we need to lower the temperature after the Butler incident, and now for you to make that kind of comment in your question, because it, your question involved a comment and a statement. And, uh, you know, it is, uh, it, that is also incredibly dangerous. She, so Peter Ducey is dangerous. Mm -hmm. So she, a moment ago, calls President Trump a threat to democracy. Right. And he's saying these are dangerous words. And she said, no, I'm not you. Well, I never I don't call him a threat. You just said that President Biden labels him a threat to democracy. At what point are you going to stop using that language that you're, he's a threat to? He was president for four years. What threat was there to our democracy? I, I don't know if you've looked at the country right now, if you've stared at it in the face, but it's been a disaster. So what threat exactly? Could she, could she clarify? But All right, now one week to go until the election, Pennsylvania police have uncovered a significant case of election fraud. Around October 21st, Lancaster County detectives reported receiving 2,500 voter registration forms uh, just before the submission deadline. These were dropped off in two huge batches. These forms, which were submitted last minute, were dated back to June of this year. Now, publications like Zero Hedge speculate the timing of this fraud was deliberate, likely intended to overwhelm election workers and avoid getting caught. Now, thankfully, this attempt was caught, especially in a swing state like Pennsylvania. However, that's not what's happening in Virginia, where a Democrat judge has just ordered Governor Yunkin of Virginia to put illegal immigrants and illegal voter registration back into the system. Now, this fraud appears linked to a voter canvassing organization that allegedly paid individuals to gather registration. Some forms were entirely fabricated, while others had real names but fake signatures. Now, Lancaster County DA Heather Adams explained that the fraudulent registration are believed to be connected to a large-scale canvassing operation started back in June, uh, but the dates uh, are around August 15th. So it, it looks like they were gathering these, these fake ballots for about two months. While the organization behind the scheme hasn't been named publicly yet, two scenarios are likely. Either workers falsified information in order to collect fees on more applications, or the group was involved in a larger scheme to sway the election. My belief is they were trying to sway the election. Now, if undetected, this fraud could have added thousands of illegal votes to the Pennsylvania system. In some states like Georgia, where Trump supposedly lost by 10 or 11,000 fraudulent votes, uh, one dump like this would have added 10 to 20 percent of the fake votes necessary in order to flip the election. Do you understand what I'm saying? One drop was 10 to 20 percent of all it took to cause Trump to lose an election. Now, unfortunately, this wasn't the only instance of election interference reported. Earlier today, a ballot drop box in Portland, Oregon, in a conservative area, was set on fire. Just an hour later, another box in Vancouver, Washington, was also set on fire. Fortunately, the Oregon box had fire protection uh, and most of the ballots were spared. However, in Washington, 
uh, hundreds of ballots were destroyed. In California, a drain pipe was found with hundreds of ballots stuffed inside instead of being delivered to voters through the U.S. Postal Service. There is election shenanigans happening, and most of it is against Donald Trump. Now, there are currently multiple videos of these ballot boxes burning on social media. I've never seen evidence of election fraud that was so undeniable. Somebody is trying to block votes by hundreds and thousands. While I can't claim every event is connected, the labels that Harris and Biden have used on Trump are likely causing people to panic. For example, if you genuinely believe that Donald J. Trump is, is Adolf Hitler, you would do anything, including rig the election by burning ballots, ballot harvesting, making up fake ballots, voting for people you shouldn't in order to sway the vote away from Donald J. Trump. Again, I mean, just, just last week, Harris called an emergency meeting to let everyone know that Donald Trump is Hitler. Then they, they had this beautiful, beautiful rally in New York City. Uh, and they literally called MAGA voters and Donald Trump and his followers Nazis and Hitlers the entire time. So everyone that went to Madison Square Gardner, Gar Garden, Gardner, that's my name, Garden, and uh, inside and out, close to about 110,000 total. They're saying all those people are Nazis. It's, it's crazy. Now, this caused Donald Trump, the former president, to issue a huge legal threat about voter fraud. And I'm so glad that he did it. Let me put it up on the screen. I'm going to read it uh, while it's on here. He says, I, together with many attorneys and legal scholars, am watching the sanctity of the 2024 presidential election very closely because I know better than most the rampant cheating and skullduggery that has taken place by the Democrats in the 2020 presidential election. It was a disgrace to our nation. Therefore, the 2024 election, where votes have just started being cast, will be under the closest professional scrutiny. And when I win, those people that cheated will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, which will include long-term prison sentences so that the depravity of justice does not happen again. We cannot let our country further devolve into a third world nation, and we won't. Please beware that the legal exposure extends to lawyers, political operatives, donors, illegal voters, and corrupt election officials. These, those involved in unscrupulous behavior will be sought out, caught, and prosecuted at levels, unfortunately, never seen before in our country. So Donald Trump is taking election integrity serious. He's saying, we are going to set an example and we're going to have to prosecute and jail people for what they are doing. You guys, one drop off, literally 10 to 20% of the elections needed to rig the election against Donald Trump. How many others have already come in that they didn't catch? And then down in Virginia, they're literally forcing the governor to put thousands of names back on the voter rolls. This is crazy. So of course, now you have people like, uh, Brian Tyler Cohen, MSNBC, others, they're saying, oh my gosh, look, Trump is Hitler. He's, he's threatening to lock people up. Well, guess what? If you cheat in the election, it's already something you could be prosecuted and put in jail for. So all he's doing is reminding people and then saying, I will follow through. You will be held accountable. We've been saying on this show now for more than a year that Trump will likely win in a landslide, but that the deep state will never allow him to be inaugurated as president of the United States on January 20th. The CIA will not allow it. The, the very same group of people, of course, who doesn't want him to become president because he's going to defund them largely and put them out of business. Uh, and now we're hearing from the we're hearing from the deep state that the deep state is preparing for martial law in the United States in order to prevent Trump from becoming president. You know, he'll win the election, clearly. 
by a landslide. It's seeming, seemingly was what's about to happen. But January 20th rolls around. This is how you can keep Congress from getting him into the presidency. They're already setting ballot boxes on fire in Oregon, Washington state, in the swing districts where Trump is polling very, very strong. Um, overnight, Clark County, Washington, had another ballot box set on fire. This in addition to the ones in Vancouver, Washington, and in Oregon. This is United States of America. You look at this, you'd be like, oh, that's probably happening in some third world country right now. No, that's the United States of America setting ballot boxes on fire in areas, in swing areas where Trump is polling really well and doing really well. This is the tolerance, right? This is the tolerance we talk about. Hundreds of ballots up in flames. These areas that were hit in blue states are currently polling very well for Trump. They are swing counties. This is why Clayton and I today were like, are we, we have our ballots. We're like, are we going to mail these? Or are we going to go in? No, we're going in physically. Yeah, because and we I receive. don't trust it. Yeah. yeah. I know uh, let us know what your plan is. If you've already mailed it, how do you feel about that? Because, well, two things. One, I want a sticker to wear around all day. Right. Uh, and then also, yeah, I just don't trust it putting that ballot in the mail anymore. Let me know how you feel about that. So one way or another, they're trying to stop him right now. Either it's burning the ballots or something else. This is why we, as I, I, we just said, we're going on election day to the polling location voting in person. I mean, you guys do you. I mean, it's up to you. Too. And I'm certainly they're pushing it over. I think the numbers overnight are about 45 million Americans have already voted. 45 million Americans have already voted. And they thought their ballots would be safe. Mm -hmm. They drop them in these ballot boxes. They're like, I'm doing my good for the country. Until you see the local news and you're like, wait a second, that's the exact ballot box that I dropped mine off in. Right. And they're all up in flames now. Yeah. Uh, Chad MC says, I'm voting in person. Yeah, let us know in the comments uh, what you guys are planning to doing. Meanwhile, deep state whistleblower, former State Department cyber expert Mike Benz is warning that they will not let Trump move back into the Oval Office, even if he wins in a landslide. Watch. So is your sense that on, say, January 20th, if Trump does win clearly in the election, is your sense that on, tw on January 20th, uh, Trump will be, will be inaugurated or no? This period between November 5th and January 6th is going to be extremely intense. If Trump wins, my sense is that you will see street paramilitary left wing slash never Trump right even potentially. You're going to see this sort of summer 2020 style riot force start to break out on the streets. The media is going to portray them as pro-democracy groups who are protesting the illegitimacy of the Trump Electoral College victory. So that's going to shut down the country. It's going to start terrorizing people. It's going to start preventing people from being able to communicate. You're going to see pressure put on the social media companies, extreme pressure put on by the Justice Department, put on by the advertiser networks. You're going to see this crisis response. It's going to feel like this country is, you know, it's going to feel like the day after January 6th for two months if Trump does indeed win the Electoral College in order for them to prime the pump for their extraordinary ordinary actions on January 6th. Oh, hell. <laughs> I mean, Mike yeah. Benz further elucidating this point says those astroturfed race based street protests will be framed as organic. Wow, they just came out of nowhere. They'll be spontaneous pro-democracy demonstrations, just as for all of our CIA backed rent -a riots are abroad. The media will inflate this frame and it will give cover for Congress to block Trump's win on January 6th, 2025 and then not be able to take office in late January. At the inauguration, Kyle Serafin, friend of the show, Kyle Serafin, former FBI whistleblower, also saying this today. He said, how interesting about Mike Benz sees the same potential that me and the suspendables have been talking about in our group chat. Y'all ready for the next couple of months? Now, Kyle's referring to Garrett O'Boyle, these other FBI whistleblowers who came out and had their lives ruined after they blew the whistle on how corrupt the FBI is. Garrett O'Boyle specifically, I mean, had his life, I mean, upended because he told the truth about what the FBI was doing, weaponizing of the DOJ and going after conservatives, going after Catholics and prayer meetings and so forth. So they've already been talking about it. They know what's coming. And now you have confirmation from Mike Benz saying this is exactly what they're planning. And so you can start to see this, right? You can start to see the organic street protests. People are taking to the streets. They're upset that Trump won. They're upset. There's going to be like anti-race, you know, there's mm -hmm. going to be these race, uh, these organic um, um, uh, race-based street protests. Yeah. It's terrifying. And you know exactly the game plan. So just be aware of the game plan. This is what they're going to do. 
Is there voter fraud in the United States? Well, of course there is. It'd be almost impossible for there not to be. But my next guest was a Justice Department lawyer who worked in the voter fraud division, and he litigated voter fraud under both Bush and Obama's Department of Justice until he couldn't. His book, Injustice, tells the story about how the Obama administration used the Department of Justice to litigate voter fraud when it worked for the Democrats and then leave it alone when it did not. Now, I read this book over the weekend. I'm more convinced than ever that the media does not know what they're talking about when they're covering voter fraud. It happens. It is politicized. And guess what? There is a lucrative industry to deny voter fraud. And in 2011, our next guest warned that who funds this denial industry? George Soros, the globalist. J. Christian Anderson joins us to discuss. And it's my pleasure to meet you, sir. Hi, how are you? So did I get anything wrong there? Is that an apt summary of your book that voter fraud is politicized and it happens and we are not told about it properly? Yeah, I mean, look, I remember right after Obama won that uh, Attorney General Holder came down to the office and then the political appointees came down to the voting section and basically told us we're not going to enforce certain parts of federal law that require voter rolls to be clean. And they just told us that straight up. That wasn't their priority. And, you know, I wrote about that in the book and and um, that became the reality. And there hasn't been a single federal DOJ lawsuit since that day in 2009 uh, to do voter roll cleanup. We used to do that at the voting section, but not anymore. Okay, so what you're talking about is Section 8 of the Voter Rights Act, which requires states to have clean voter registration logs. Uh, So now the media is saying that this is voter purging, acting like it's brand new. So can you explain how this is not brand new and how this is being politicized right now in the run up to the 2024 election? Yes. Section eight of the National Voter Registration Act was passed in 1993. It was the top priority of Bill Clinton and the Democrat legislature. There's a amendment to the law that uh, you know, got got it through a filibuster in the Senate that said you have to make a reasonable effort to maintain the rolls free of the dead and the people who don't live there anymore. Reasonable effort is the statute. And so the Bush Justice Department brought a bunch of cases against uh, against various states for having dirty voter rolls. And, and um, you know, like I said, those cases are dead. So we have a situation now where the law enforcement officials in charge of our elections just don't care about dirty voter rolls. And that includes people like Jocelyn Benson in Michigan. The Public Interest Legal Foundation has been suing her for the last couple of years. We've been in court fighting her over dirty voter rolls in Michigan heading into this election. And she's Can fighting to the nail. You mean it not it not just is non-citizens who have been self-identified, but also dead people, right? What what else is dirty about a voter roll? Michigan had 27,000 dead people on the active voter rolls. Some had been dead for two decades, and that's why we brought the federal lawsuit against the Michigan Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson. So, you know, it includes people who uh, haven't been dead since the, haven't been alive since the 90s. Okay, now one of the things the Justice Department in its litigation against some states is saying is that you can't clean up your voter logs within 90 days of the election. Where does that come from? And why is the Justice Department forcing states to leave their rolls dirty, for lack of a better word? Yeah, that's the federal freeze out. Uh, That's also in the law where there cannot be systematic list maintenance. That's the term from the statute. Uh, inside 90 days of any federal election. That didn't even includes a primary. And so within 90 days of any federal election, states are only allowed under the law to remove dead people, it, people who have gone insane, which nobody does, uh, people who have um, uh, gone to prison in a state that disenfranchises you for that. Not all states do or to correct mistakes or things that are not systematic. In other words, you know, someone calls you on the phone and says, please take me off the rolls. So there's a federal law that doesn't allow you to do systematic list maintenance inside 90 days. 
Okay, so then are these states outside of their rights to keep trying to do this? What Florida has said is we've been trying to do this and the Justice Department won't help us outside of their software. They just say check the software. Yeah, I think this revolves, Florida's fighting to get access to what's called the SAVE database, Systematic Alien Verification for Entitlement, SAVE. And under federal law, the federal government has to make it available to the states. Florida was, Florida already sued the federal government. It was called, I think the case is called Florida versus Holder in 2012. And uh, the court said, you've got to give the access to the database. Now, how you give that access, whether it's really, you know, nice and friendly and useful, or if it's begrudging, that's the issue going on right now with Florida. And the, the database itself lists all of the aliens that, DHS has knowledge of. Okay. So then should states have done this a long time ago? The media reports about voter purging. Is that legitimate? It's just too late to do it? Yeah, I, I always purging, by the way, is a, a, a language tested left wing term. Uh, yes. I call it list sure. maintenance because that's what the statute calls it. But they love to call it purging because that's what happens after you eat bad fish or what Stalin did to his generals it was very violent. So they try to make you hate the idea. Uh, but yeah, list maintenance is what it is. And states are doing this on odd numbered years. This is an odd numbered year project more than an even numbered year project. They will do another large list maintenance batch in January in most places. Uh, so this is an issue that, you know, is usually done in odd numbered years. Okay, so then why is it being done now? Is it, it just political? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough, I mean, you could, you could squeeze this in, in, uh, first of all, if they're dead, you could do it right up to election day. So that's why it's being okay. done now, because people are still dying. It hasn't gone out of style. And so people are dying and they can be removed from the voter rolls, even under the federal law. Okay. One of the things, though, you said that the Obama Justice Department did, which was enforce Section 7 of the Voter Rights Act, which allows voter registration at welfare and motor vehicle locations. You testified to Congress this year that actually this becomes a dragnet for illegal immigrants who don't even understand what they're doing. Uh, and so can you explain this? And do you think that the Biden Justice Department is also doing this, favoring Section 7 over Section 8 or other uh, non-favorable oh, yeah. democratic policies? Absolutely. Section that? seven is basically the welfare agency registration, which you have to do under motor voter, you know, DMV, social service agencies. This is the part they love, right? They they love forcing states to, you know, make a, a welfare office, a, a voter registration office. And so that's great. That's what Congress passed. But if you're going to do that, you got to do what's the other part of section eight, which is voter roll cleanup. It was meant to be a double whammy. Yeah, you register everybody, but you keep the rolls clean. And under the Democrat administrations, it's only worried about welfare agency registration and not keeping the rolls clean. Right. And you mentioned not getting military, overseas military, their ballots as well, because the welfare state voters are going to favor Democrats, uh, Democrats rather, and the military voters will favor Republicans. So is that also still going on? You know, that's a great question. And what you're referring to is something called UACAVA. Uh, UACAVA is the for military voters and overseas voters. And it's wildly popular. It, it uh, passed the Senate, in, I think, 99 to nothing. Uh, and so I, I think that, that the Justice Department was beat up enough in the early part of the last decade that they finally started making sure the military votes are getting counted. OK, so another thing that you talk about is that in a lot of these black communities, they have what's called voter assistance. You found evidence of voters being walked into the polls and people overhearing these assistants saying, vote that one, vote that one, vote that one. Uh, is this still happening? That's shocking. Yeah, oh, totally. I mean, look, a uh, couple things to keep in mind. Uh, not that I want to make this a law class, but. There's a part of the Voting Rights Act called Section 208 that allows anybody uh, to have an assister of choice uh, to help them vote if they need help. And the only two people it can't be is their union representative or their employer. And so what you have all over the country are people imposing assistance. 
the key question is, did the voter get to pick the candidate or did the assister? That's the key question. Was there free will in the choice uh, by the voter? And so the Department of Justice is supposed to be rooting that out to make sure that there is no voter fraud. You write about how you tried to do that as a Department of Justice lawyer, and that sort of fell by the wayside under Democratic administrations. Is that correct? Yeah. And so, look, I, I had a case in Mississippi where this was a central issue. Write about it a lot in the book, Injustice, where yes, the Ike Brown people case. were... Be- Right, the Ike Brown case, and people were being voted by assisters. A famous one, Patsy Roby, was one of the ones cited in court papers that was essentially going to people's houses and voting their ballots. And we put up evidence at trial. You know, anybody who says that voter fraud doesn't exist haven't read the opinion in U.S. v. Ike Brown or read anything about U.S. v. Ike Brown because the whole case was about um, removing the choice of voters by assisters in many cases, where these notaries would fan out across the county and go into people's homes and actually vote their ballot. And we put up some of the victims at trial. So this is not some myth. Uh, There's actually trial testimony about it. Now, one of the things I found so shocking and I thought to myself, why have I not thought about this before? Is that there is a major industry of voter fraud denial. The media will tell you, you say, the media will tell you like, within hours of an election that there was no fraud. That's not possible. That's not how fraud rears its ugly head. So anytime the media says nothing to see here, usually there's something to see here. Who, you mentioned George Soros, and I look back and I said, you said this in 2011. Oh my God. So who are the people beyond George Soros funding this fraud denial industry? And obvious question, why would they do that? Well, since I wrote the book, 13 years ago, there's a whole crop of new donors, uh, Arabella, uh, these, these, these venture funds uh, like Arabella and others have cropped up to give huge amounts of money to left-wing organizations like the Brennan Center. Uh, you, they're, they're reflexive. They're like, they're like um, uh, circus trick animals. Like, is there any voter fraud? No, says squawks the bird. And, and so, it's these folks who are reactionary. They never say there's voter fraud because they're not allowed to. It's contrary to their, their gospel. Um, the truth is somewhere else. The truth is there is. Um, how much? I don't know, because we can't ever research it, can we? We're shut down by groups like, like Project Vote and, and the Democracy, uh, you know, this or that organization. So it's real. I know the victims. I've been in their homes. It's a shame that they can't do something about it. They're reflexively defending it. Right. So you started the Public Interest Legal Foundation, and you have your hands full now with fighting these types of things from the other side since you voluntarily left the Justice Department. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about leaving the Justice Department and what your, uh, your counsel does now? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, it's funny. I, I left the department after I was subpoenaed by the Civil Rights United States Commission on Civil Rights to talk about the new Black Panther case that I worked on, and I was told I wasn't allowed to, um, but I did anyhow. I, I I quit and I testified about it. Um, but now the irony is that President Trump appointed me to the United States Commission on Civil Rights, so I'm a commissioner on the commission that um, you know started my departure from the DOJ. Uh, Public Interest Legal Foundation. What do we do? We're the nation's only C3 charity law firm that's dedicated exclusively to election integrity. And so, you know, we we bring cases um, all over the country to make election day election day, to to have transparency, to we're going to be following a case this week about voter intimidation. Um, Whatever it is to enforce the law that DOJ won't enforce, we will do it. Okay, excellent. Well, I'm so glad to talk to you for the first time. Uh, I, there's another bit about in your book about the Justice Department suing companies 
through frivolous cases in order to transfer wealth to radical left-wing organizations. I'm going to leave that as a cliffhanger so people can read that for yourself because I found that also shocking, um, especially the fact that you said it over a decade ago. So t- uh, check out the book for yourself. It's called Injustice. And uh, Mr. Adams, please come back on Redacted some other time. Thank you for this context. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.